Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well today we're going to talk a little bit about soldering. And it's something that I think a lot of people struggle with. And what made me think about doing a video about this is I just had a viewer about a month ago they emailed me and said hey I tried to build your little 6 BMA amp and I think I bit off more than I could chew and I got done with it and I can't get past like the dim bulb test and I really hate it that you know he wasn't even like really crying about spending the money and not being able to get it finished it was more I just want to hear what this sounds like and you know I feel like I got fairly close or at least you know put in a really good effort and you know last summer I just kind of gave up on it and would you take a look at it and well I don't normally like doing repair work I feel like if it's one of my builds or one of my designs that somebody's tried to build and had trouble with I don't mind trying to fix it for them obviously you're gonna pay me for my time but you know, this guy really put an honest effort into it, and I hate that he wasn't able to get it to work right. And I know it's a nice sounding little amp, so he shipped it to me. And the main thing that I noticed when I took it apart was that the soldering joints just looked bad. And then when I went back in and tried to work on it, I don't know what kind of solder he was using, but it was impossible for me to get this old school solder to even stick to it. So I ended up having to throw away most of the tag strips and the tube sockets because it was just a hot mess. And I asked him what kind of solder did you use? And he was like, well, I used this lead-free solder and then I tried some other kind of no-clean solder. And I was like, I think that's the problem that people have. They don't know what kind of solder and stuff to use that works well for hobbyists. And so I thought I would go over that. And I'll put a link in the description for the stuff that I've been using. And I've tried some different kind of solder. I bought some Alpha, I think it was 3743 No Clean Solder. And I've been soldering for years and I couldn't make it work. I mean, it was just it just seemed like it, it wouldn't flow. It would just kind of beat up on the joints and it would never like just flow and spread into the joint. And so I got a pound of it sitting over there. If somebody wants it, send me an email, pay for the shipping and you can have it because I can't use it. So anyway, I've been using this MG Chemicals 6040 RA solder which I'm told is like the old school rosin core stuff. And this stuff works great. For point to point wiring, I use the 050 inch stuff. And then for circuit boards, I use the 032. So I've got spools of both here. The other thing I've had good luck with is this copper desoldering wick stuff. Now, one of the tricks I've learned of this is you need to put a little bit of flux on it, or there needs to be a little flux nearby when you start the process. And you need to have a clean iron. We'll get to that in just a second. But a little bit of flux on this goes a long way to making it just really suck solder out of joints when you make a mistake, especially with like PC board kind of stuff. If you've got to, you know, clean it out. The other little trick that somebody showed me was to use either a sewing needle or a toothpick to kind of clean the hole out. And then obviously the solder doesn't stick to either one of those. And so you can like put it in the hole, let it cool off and then pull it out. Then you got the hole where you can put the lead through. So that's a little trick on, you know, desoldering or replacing parts on a PC board. And if you use this stuff, you won't rip the traces off. I hear people talking about that working on some of these, you know, like the 
R8s and stuff, trying to replace the bias pots or the capacitors in those, of you know, pulling the traces up off the boards and stuff. And I think a lot of that is also related to not running the soldering iron hot enough. I run this one at 750 degrees Fahrenheit, which I'm not sure what that is in centigrade. You can do the math. But I run the iron really hot. And doing that does cause a little bit of issue with the tip not staying clean and the flux turning all weird and black on it. You got to constantly be cleaning the tip and retinning it, which is like just dipping a little solder onto the iron. And this holder here on this Heiko iron that I use, it has both the gold stuff in here and it's got a little sponge here that you can put a little water on. Now when you pull the tip across the water, you absolutely have to tin it again because it like just kind of messes up the chemical reaction that's going on on the tip. But you can just dab it like that between connections and it stays pretty tinned. And you're going to be feeding the solder in anyway. And I'll kind of show you that technique in a minute. The other thing you want to get is a little tub of the rosin core solder, the old school stuff. And like I said, this is good for putting on the solder wick stuff to help it, you know, pull the solder out of joints you're trying to desolder. And it doesn't hurt to just dab a little bit on with a brush onto stuff that may not be, you know, surgically clean that you're going to be soldering to. So when you're going to be soldering stuff, the other important thing is the stuff you're going to be soldering needs to be relatively clean. And so I keep, you can see how worn out this is, a little piece of scotch Bright that I kind of go across the tack strips and shine them up a little bit. And I'll even pull resistor leads through it if they look a little bit corroded, if they've been sitting around somewhere or there's some old stock power resistors or something that I bought off eBay that are a little black looking, a little oxidized looking. Clean them up before you try to solder them because there's no point in trying to solder onto something that's dirty. And again, if you're a newbie to soldering, it's not going to hurt anything to just brush a little flux on the stuff you're going to be working with. And that just helps make things easier because the flux is in the solder. If there's no flux on what you're trying to solder, it's not going to solder. It's going to be a mess. And that's part of the trick. And I obviously I don't have the iron on, but... One, the key thing that I found to soldering is when you're getting ready to solder something together is you put the soldering iron on both components that you're trying to heat up. And if you've got a tag strip, put the heat on the tag strip first and get it hot and then kind of move the iron over to the lead. First thing you want to do is rub, do a little bit of solder on the tip, not on the item that you're soldering, but on the tip. And what that does, it releases some of the flux that's in the solder and then it'll flow down onto the surface of the thing you're trying to heat up. And it kind of makes a pool of solder on the tip that the pool of solder on the tip against the item is what causes the heat transfer. If you just put the iron on there and it doesn't have, you know, any solder on it, it's never going to transfer the heat. So anyway... Maybe I'll do another video in the future where I kind of go over, like, I mean, you've seen me soldering in other videos, so I don't know if I need to do that, but maybe in the future I'll kind of do a little, you know, video showing you soldering some stuff. You know, leave in the comments below if you think that you want to see something like that. Maybe I could do a little demo video of just soldering some stuff with tag strips sitting out on the type bench and just kind of show you how that works. This soldering station is awesome. I mean, I know there's all kinds of cheaper things, but this isn't a lot of money. And this is, uh, I think it's a FX888D. Again, I'll put the link below. This tip that comes with it, this little kind of chisel, small chisel tip, it works great for doing the kind of work that we're doing. So you don't need to buy anything extra. Just this deal. The handle stays nice and cool. I can be soldering for hours in the handle stays cool enough it's not like whoa you know it never gets like that which a lot of cheaper irons do it's temperature regulated you know you can buy new parts for it if you need to i've been using this thing for several years now 
and still using the tip that it came with. And so it's just, it's really high quality stuff. And having nice tools is just makes things a joy to do. Last thing that you need, you need some sort of ventilator. You don't want to be breathing the flux. And I've made that mistake before and wasn't, sometimes I still forget to turn the fan on and you can end up getting a sore throat. And I know breathing this stuff is not good for your health. And so make sure you get a fan. This one's got a little charcoal pad. It came with three or four, you know, replacement ones. I think I've replaced the little pad once. I will warn you though, when I first got this one, this was a little cheap made in China one off Amazon. It's 110 volt. When I first got it, I had it just hooked up to the wall outlet, and I was like, holy smoly, this thing is noisy. And it was just annoying AF. I mean, I just, I couldn't use it. And then I saw, hey, it's 110 volt. I wonder what it sounds like plugged into my bucking transformer that I made for that Noob Sound 6P1. It works great if you step the voltage down to 110 volts. So if you're going to use one of these or you buy one of these, make sure you read the voltage rating and then make sure that you adjust the voltage going to it to match what the fan says or else it's going to be crazy loud and you're not going to want to use it. It just it makes it super annoying. So really, one of these fans is just mandatory if you're going to be doing this kind of stuff to get the fumes away from you. So anyway, I'm going to put the links in the description below. Just wanted to do kind of a short video for this. And I have a feeling that if that guy that sent me that amp, if he had had a nice soldering iron and had been using this kind of solder and had a little bit of flux in one of these fans, he probably wouldn't have had to send the amp to me. And I ended up charging him a couple hundred bucks to gut the amp and then rewire everything. And it sounds great, which, you know, I guess it's still kind of a deal. And I'm not sure how often I would do that for folks. But if you have tried to build one of my projects and you just can't get it to work and you can't, you know, and you've kind of just kind of thrown your hands up, shoot me an email and we'll see if we can work something out and have me go through it, get it working for you and get you a, a nice sounding tube amp. I hate for people to have made the investment and in time to fabricate the chassis and everything and then either because they can't solder or don't know how to do that kind of thing that they have kind of just got stuck. I hate for that to happen because these this is supposed to be a fun hobby. So anyway, again, if you've Attempted one of my projects and just can't get things to work right. Shoot me an email. I'll see if I can help you out. So anyway, I think that's kind of it for this video. Thanks to you folks for watching my videos. I hope they're instructional and kind of help you along in this hobby. Thanks to all you Patreon supporters. All you folks that make donations at my website. I really appreciate that. That helps me move things along and keep making these videos and making content for you guys so we can learn how to do hi-fi on a budget. And until the next video, have a nice day.